Welcome to What is in the Air, where we explore inspired living through simple life experiments. Welcome to another episode of What is in the Air where we explore and embrace inspired living with simple life experiments and challenges. And today, a life experiment is around connecting with people, with interesting people in your lives. And I want to start with a little bit of a story. Maybe even before that, how about a quote from Dale Carnegie? You can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. Well, maybe the goal is about making friends, maybe not. I would suggest that this life experiment is actually just about making meaningful connections with other people, and there's some real power in that. So let me just talk about a personal experience that led to this experiment in my own life. One of the first professional books that I read after graduating from college, I graduated with with a kind of a triple major in history, religious studies, and education, and I took a job as a middle and high school teacher right out of college. And so I was reading about education, sort of refining my skill about uh, the art and science of teaching. And so one of the first professional books that I read after graduating from college was a text by by Howard Gardner. Um, a uh, a scholar, a, a cognitive psychologist at Harvard University, and the book was called Frames of Mind. Now, this is a book that popularized the concept of what's now referred to as multiple intelligences. It's the theory that people are not defined by a single IQ or intelligent quotient. It's not like you're a genius because you have a, this number IQ. Rather, Gardner argues in the book that uh, intelligence is actually not a single thing. It's you have multiple intelligences. It's more accurate to recognize that each person has uh, multiple intelligences, and he broke it up into musical intelligence, visual, spatial, I think music, musical, rhythmic intelligence, visual, spatial intelligence, verbal, l- linguistic intelligence, logical, mathematical, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal. And then later on, actually wasn't in the first version of the book, he added another one called naturalistic. Now, uh, this theory gained traction and attention in the 1990s, and it persists even to today. You can't. You can hardly find an educator who has not heard of multiple intelligences. It's really informed people's thinking, even if it's been misused or misinterpreted many times. Now, I'm not actually telling you sto- this story because of the content of the book. I'm telling you it because it leads to this this experiment that we're going to try out. Hopefully, you're going to try out. Um, this is a really intriguing and important theory in the book. And uh, it really personally influential book for me. It just helped me think about my own identity differently and to think about the identity of those around me much differently. This book represents for me something else, a first experience in my life. It was the first time that I ever reached out to the author of a book that I was reading, with the exception perhaps of in college where I might have had a professor who had us read his or her book. And I was talking to the professor. This was the first time that I was reading a book by someone that I didn't know. And then I reached out to and I connected with that person. So it was it was um, about 1994, man, uh, maybe. Yeah, about 1994. And um, I'd only had an email address for a couple of years at that time. And I had actually dabbled and, and geeked out on bulletin boards and other things like that, kind of pre-modern day internet, but that's for another another time perhaps. But I'd only had an email address for a couple of years at the most. And it was my first professional, my job out of college, um, full-time job. And I was just beginning to discover the, I would say, maybe the power, the possibility, and the connectivity of the internet. And so I was reading Frames of Mind, this book by Howard Gardner, in my little one-bedroom apartment. And I had a small Mac that I used as a computer. So I was sitting next to the Mac reading this book, Frames of Mind. I think I was taking notes. 
highlighting ideas that intrigued me. I'd write questions and notes in the margin. I had idea books that I used even back then to take notes and to record things that fascinated me. And, and so on this particular day, uh, while reading the book, I was struggling to understand something. There was some idea, it was part of his original research that he was describing, and it intrigued me. And I just remember thinking at that moment, man, I wish I could talk to the author about this. I wish I could just have a conversation with him. I'd like to understand this. And, and, um, and so at that moment, I looked over at my computer and I thought, hmm, I wonder if Howard Gardner has a website and an email address. This was early. Colleges were just getting online in many cases. And so um, it might it might seem like a really simple question today, but uh, even today, I talk to lots of people, they read books, they never, ever think of the possibility of reaching out, about the possibility of reaching out to the author of a book they're reading or they're interested in, they're like. But at that moment, I moved over to my computer, I searched for Howard Gardner by name. I did not Google him because at that time, uh, Google was not on my radar. Uh, I think I Alta Vista'd him. I think that was actually this, the search engine that I used at that point. And, um, and I searched and I, I think I found actually, I went to Harvard's website and then I looked through and I think he was maybe under the education, not the psychology faculty, maybe the education faculty list. I found a web page for him and sure enough, his email address was right there. So email readily available which is commonplace for academics. So I copied it, I pasted it, pasted it in a new email message. I crafted a few comments and my questions. Uh, I, in my comment, I, I thanked him, talked about how um, how thought provoking the book was, how it was, you know, potentially paradigm shifting for me at the time. And then I posed my question and I sent it off. At the time, it still felt kind of like. Uh, you know, it felt like the digital equivalent of of putting a message in a bottle and throwing it into the sea. Uh, I didn't really expect to get a response because this all seemed kind of magical to me still. Um, is there any chance that he'd actually reply? I remember wondering. And he did within two days in that instant um, with the reply. In that instant, reading a book turned into something completely different for me. Or not completely different, but qualitatively different. It was a two-way conversation with the author. I could actually reach out to the author in this day and age. I felt this, this sense of pride. I felt a sense of accomplishment. I was honored to be acknowledged and deemed worthy of a response. Not only that, the author of every book after this became more real and accessible to me. In my mind, I would imagine each author at a desk writing, thinking, editing, and maybe even pausing to address an email message from a reader like me. So they became more real and authentic in that moment. And I felt connected to them in a new way. Connected through the text, as I always did, but now connected in a new way. When I started creating life experiments for myself years later, I recalled this early experience and the positive emotion that it created, and I had already been reaching out to more authors after that. It was a, a rather regular experience. When I would read a book, it wasn't every book that I read, but at least every third or fourth book that I read, I would usually reach out to the author. And more often than not, I would get a meaningful reply back from the author. It was, and each one, I was so overjoyed. It was like I was opening a present on my birthday. And, um, and so it was, it was, it was really, really, a um, really a powerful transformative experience for me. Um, so later on when I was experimenting and, and starting this formal kind of life experiment piece, I decided to take these past efforts and experiences around connecting with authors and turn it into a formal experiment. And below is, as usual, not the exact one that I used initially, but it's pretty close, and I encourage you to give it a try. It, it, it If you've not done this before, it, it really does have um, a shift in, in one's thinking. At least it did for me, and I suspect it will for others. So here is the experiment, little recipe, a six-step recipe for you. 
Step one, create a list of at least seven interesting things that you've read lately or you hope to read in the future. Now, I thought about this experiment, and for the sake of the experiment, um, because I really see value in doing something in a condensed time period, like seven days, it allows you to follow through and to get it done, but it also uh, gives you that sense of of it, it's packed, it's all packed together, and it gives this kind of intensity that's great. So um, for the sake of this experiment, I'm suggesting that you go with something short. So a list of things that are interesting that you've read or you hope to read, or you can ask others for ideas, the best article you've read in the last year, things like that. And and I would say pick short books, articles, essays, or something that um, will not take you days or weeks to read, something that you could read in a day or even an hour or two. Also, in preparation, find the email address or contact information for the author of each of the readings that you selected. So you want to get all of that done in advance and have your stack and have everything prepared. That's going to help you follow through on this experiment. So you get that all set. And now you're going to block off time on your calendar to read each of the articles um, or items uh, one each day, one each day of the experiment. Um, On day one of the experiment, read the first item in your list, highlighting interesting ideas and recording questions or thoughts that come to mind as you read. Imagine that you're going to be going to coffee with that person who wrote that article in a couple hours. And so you want to get ready so that you're a good conversationalist. Get ready for it. Um, So you're going to get a chance to talk with the author. Be deeply curious as you read that article. Jot down thoughts and comment and other things like that. Um, Once you're finished reading, now it's time to get into the heart of the experiment. It's time to um, open up your email and to craft and send a message to the author. You can express thanks for what they wrote, but also engage the author with a question or a comment. Keep it short. Keep it sincere. Keep it civil. (laughs) And then you repeat this each day for seven days. At the end, as always, take time to reflect on the experience. How many people replied to you? What did you think and feel? How did this experiment influence how you think about reading? How did your letter writing change or stay the same throughout? Would you have written the letter differently? How did you respond uh, um, to the different kinds of reactions? Uh, uh, You know, there's a lot that you can ponder. so, So go for that. In terms of tips... Let me give you maybe, uh, I think I have five, five written down here. One is don't argue with the author. This is an experiment about connecting with people in a new way. You don't have to agree with what the author wrote, but you can use this as a chance to learn and understand a different perspective. So not every interaction with a person has to be about um, one person being right and the other wrong. Sometimes it can be about perspective taking and understanding. And that's what I'm suggesting this can be in your first contact and connection with the authors. Second, don't take it personally. If you never hear from the person or if it's a short and underwhelming reply or response, people are busy and some get lots of emails. You will likely get follow up from some assistants or others, depending upon the person. Uh, as that's actually what I did with uh, the Howard Gardner example. I think it was actually the assistant, but the assistant would sit down with Howard Gardner and go through messages and he would give replies and dictate. And then the assistant would write them back. So I was actually getting a personal reply from Howard Gardner, but it was through this uh, assistant. Still, it was, it was incredibly cool for me as a, um, as a 22 year old or however old I was. Yet some of those replies are sent um, after consulting with the author from those assistants, like I just described. So keep that in mind. Um, Keep in mind also that you are, you have no existing relationship with this person. So choose a tone and context that is appropriate. That means that you don't go around calling them by some nickname that you think they might like or not. Use an appropriate title or reference to them. When in doubt, be a bit conservative about how you approach this. If they give you permission and you're having a series of exchanges, which has happened to me a lot where we go back and forth, sometimes over days, weeks, or months, or even in a few instances, years where I've developed friendships this way. Um, but, uh, um, but think about that. Think about what is appropriate writing style and appropriate to say or not say when you're talking to someone for the first time and think about them, realize that you're coming from a certain perspective, but think about their perspective as you write. Um, also speaking as a author of seven books, I've, I've written or edited or co-authored, uh, seven different books so far. I love to hear from readers. So while this, while this might feel like you are imposing 
You're absolutely not. You're being human and you're connecting. If they don't want to talk to you, they'll tell you or they'll, they'll ignore you. And that's fine. So, so um, really nothing to fear here. Just reach out and see what happens. And then uh, another one. Consider what you can learn from this experiment. Personally, this experiment opened me up to reaching out to people far more often. And I can't even begin to share the myriad of stories about where this led. There are instances where I've developed new relationships, new friendships, new colleg- uh, collegial relationships. There are some people where it, our connection occurred this way. And by the way, now it's two-way for me, where me being an author, there are people that are reaching out to me all the time. And well, not all the time. Not, um, it's not even daily for me right now. It's maybe weekly. But um, but but that changes. Some weeks I'll get multiple emails. And um uh, and then I'm reaching out to others. So it's kind of a dual thing. But I can say from in both directions, uh, new relationships. In fact, I have, I have um, more than one person, people, more than one person, people, <laughs> how do you say that? Um, more, than, more than one has turned into a, a mentor where I will run ideas past them and, and they will run ideas past me on occasion too. And we'll give each other feedback on projects and it's ongoing. I have, I have uh, a number that have gone on for years, one, at least, a, I think almost a decade, um, new insights. So you, you may gain some new insights into something you read, never, ever thought about it. I've had instances where people have even sort of debunked their own writing to me. They've said, yeah, you know, I thought that when I wrote it, but here's actually what I believe now. Um, so a completely different insight than what you'd think. I've, I've even had people say, man, I wish I never wrote that. Uh, it really gets pretty personal sometimes. Um, also, it's led to a, a deep sense of gratitude and satisfaction. It's just the sense of connecting with people who are doing interesting things and people, uh, the kind of people I'd love to hang out with and spend time with and learn from. Uh, it, it also has this effect of a humanizing and a personalizing of the author that that they become just more real and authentic. I remember, oh man, what is, let me think. I'm, I'm trying to remember um, one of the books that, that really intrigued me when I was, when I was uh, in my 20s is a book called The Second Self. And I think actually there was another one before that called Life on the Screen. And this was by a scholar uh, with a psychology background based at MIT, uh, Sherry Turkle, and her focus of research on sort of uh, um, the connection between the digital space, uh, computers, and humanity. And she looked at that intersection. She wrote this book about life in the digital age and it, literally on the screen, like the, as people are living in, in, on the screen more, the second self about identity online. And then uh, later on, she wrote a book called Alone Together, um, where it was kind of a critique of how people are replacing human interaction with human computer interaction. And she wrote another one about the importance of reclaiming meaningful conversation in the digital age and actually having a a face-to-face conversation with another human being. And I had just finished my doctoral dissertation, and my dissertation was informed and influenced by some of uh, her work. And I, I reached out to her and at the time, I, I reached out to her because I was I was seeking some input because I was thinking about publishing my dissertation, and I was looking for maybe some tips or input. And I'd reached out to her because I'd also just read one of her most recent books, I believe, and I was thanking her for it and explaining how her work influenced me, something like that. I'd never met her before. She replied uh, within an hour. It, it was she must have been at her computer at the time that that the email came in. Replied within an hour, and she. She was, uh, you know, happy to hear from me, very positive. And then she was working on, um, she noted that she was working on a new book about people's relationships with devices and technologies. And she invited me to think about submitting some of my work to her for consideration in the book because it was an edited work. And I was just finished and I was really intimidated. And um, I mean, I've published now and, and my, my situation is, is quite different, but I didn't do it. I didn't share that. I did not share that writing. 
I kind of beat myself up about that a little bit now when I think, oh man, that would have been so cool to be part of that project with Sherry Turkle and who knows where that could have led in terms of research opportunities. Uh, no complaints though. I've been on an incredible journey so far in my life and, and met some amazing people and had a chance to work on incredible projects and continue to be working on new ones. But um, but I can say that uh, that I did have this incredible sense of gratitude and there was this really deep humanizing and personalizing moment for me as a new emerging scholar to have someone who, who was inviting me into a project. And I just kind of realized, Oh wait, that's how this world works. You kind of connect with someone, you invite them to join in the project and then maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. It just became more real, more personal. And uh, now I'm describing that as one who comes from an academic background, but it can happen in this, if you're connecting with people in the startup or business world or other contexts as well. Um, by the way, I can also say that this has actually, uh, I've had job offers. I've had at least, and I'm just thinking in the top of my head, I can recall at this moment at least six different job offers that came from an initiated exchange with a person and then uh, ongoing uh, conversations that emerged. And I didn't take any of them, but uh, it's just kind of cool that it exists that way. And even... Um, I've had some instances where these have led to trips to other parts of the country in some cases where I expressed uh, gratitude for what they were doing. I asked a question. I explained what I was working on in context to the question, and they became really interested, and they invited me out. And in some cases, I was even invited to be a consultant um, for an organization they worked with or someone they knew. So um, the – uh, I wasn't pursuing it for all those reasons. I was just trying to connect with someone who was interesting to me, doing interesting work, and I had a question. Apart from all of this, this exercise that I continue on my own, it continues to ground me in this beautiful reality of meaningful connections with different people in the digital age. So I hope you try this out in some form, and if you do, I would love to hear from you. As always, whatisintheair.com is the website, and I create an article for every podcast episode. So it's not regular show notes, it's more written as an article, and I have the whole recipe written out there as well. So you can check it out, and you can use it as a guide for you um, if and when you choose to take the author connection challenge. If you do take the challenge, please click on that share your story link when you're done or during it, and tell me what's happening. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, that's all I have for you in this episode. I will see you on the next one. Please take a moment and listen to this brief message from our sponsor, Locus Mindset. Locus Mindset helps highly motivated professionals and entrepreneurs master an internal locus of control so they can attain better health, greater wealth, and stronger relationships. You can start today with the Locus Mindset 15 course. This four-module course is your step-by-step -step guide to move forward beyond present circumstances and create the life you want. Learn how your brain works when it comes to goal setting, pattern matching, fear, emotions, anxiety, behaviors, and so much more. This program is ideal for you if you're motivated to move forward in your life. You've been feeling stuck in important areas of your life and are sick and tired of repeating the same life patterns, never seeing any real change. And you've tried everything, or what seems like almost everything, and nothing seems to be producing change at the very core of how you feel and how you think. Locus Mindset works with the science of the mind to produce real and lasting change. This is the only goal-setting, mindset-mastering program that you need because it works with the mind in a clear, evidence-based way to achieve real and lasting change. As you just heard from that advertisement, this episode of What is in the Air is sponsored by Locus Mindset. And just because you're a listener to What is in the Air, this podcast, you can actually get a $25 discount to the Locus Mindset Mastery course. And all you have to do is go over to locusmindset.com. That's L-O-C-U-S-M-I-N-D-S-E-T.com. And when you sign up for the course, there is a place to enter a code. And the code that you're going to enter in order to get this what is in the air only discount is only for you. You include that, you get a $25 discount. And I think you'll find it to be a really valuable course. I've personally gone through it and I found it to be 
incredibly valuable. There's some wonderful content there and some cutting edge research and insight. But as you will know, if you don't already from this podcast, content is not enough. You have to do something with it. It's about changing some patterns in your life and some behaviors and some ways of thinking. And this course will give you some great steps to do that. So check it out. See what you think.